get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founder of RX Bars, the founder of P90X, Tony Horton. He talked about, uh, Rabbi, that he made money as a street mine. So before he sold millions of dollars of P90X, he actually put his head on the street, and that's how he made his, his food and rent money um, is as a street performer. Um, the uh, founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, talked about how when he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. And there's many more cool episodes. Check them out at inspiredinsider.com. Um, the episode today is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and clients and we do that through our Done For You podcast solution, which is like a Swiss army knife for your business. It serves as a vehicle for strategic partnerships, referral marketing, content marketing. I've met my, my business partner and some of my best friends through it. I believe if you have a business, you should have a podcast, period. But um, it's more personal to me because it's not just about your business. It's about you leaving a legacy for yourself and for the guests that you feature. And it's really inspired by my grandfather, who is a Holocaust survivor, and he and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany and were the only members of their family to survive. And, and his words and legacy live on because of an interview the Holocaust Foundation did with him, which you can watch on my About page, which really inspires me. So yes, podcasting will help your business, but it really helps you and your guests leave a legacy. So um, I personally credit to the best thing I've done for my business and my life. If you have questions, you want to launch your own podcast, you can email us anytime, uh, support at rise25media.com. We're happy to answer any, any, answer any questions that you have. Today, I'm very excited. I have Rabbi Moes Navan, founding engineer at Mobileye and much more. But I first heard about Moes um, because my dad, Alan Weiss, went on an organized trip with Rabbi David Began. Shout out to his website, lechaimcenter.org. And he came back raving about the talk that you gave. Moaz. And just a little background about um, Moaz is his professional experience in the research and development of digital hardware spans over 35 years. He's worked for IBM, NASA's JPL, News Corporation's NDS, and Mobileye, where he holds several patents in the field of image processing and computing hardware. Um, he lectures often on the elements underpinning what makes Israel the startup nation. And um, he gives a great talk. I, I suggest anyone check it out on YouTube. He helped create the chip that is powering the autonomous revolution. It's the chip that Intel bought for $15.3 billion. And as I was driving in today, Mo, as I was thinking, you know, the 0. 0.3 is $300 million. Just the decimal of that is $300 million. So it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and he talks about his journey. His story is the mobilized story. He talks about his story is the startup nation story, and his story is the story of the Jewish people. He talks about in the talk. So, Moz, thank you so much for taking the time, late night Israel time, to do this. No problem. There's, there's two uh, things I correction. So, I, I mean, my name is a little bit funny for Americans to say. It's it's really Moise, like Moise. -E okay. Uh, most of my friends that I grew up with called me Mo. Um, and in Moise, Israel, you know, they try to call me Moshe, but you know, which which is my Jewish <laughs> name. But since I had this difficult name all my life, so that's what I keep. Was Moise your original given name? Because yeah, you were born dad, in the U.S. Yeah, Moise is, yeah, it's basically my grandfather's name. Um, it's a typically, you know, Sephardic, like kicked out of Spain name. Mm, right, my it. family spoke Ladino, or they were they were the, of those people that were kicked out 500 years ago and brought in by Suleiman the Magnificent and and brought into the Ottoman Empire. You know, so there's two things from Moise that I discovered from doing research about you. Okay, one is you're a glutton for punishment. Okay, so you went from startup to startup to startup, and now I realize you're getting a, a PhD. Like I just where, where does it stop? The second is your wife must be a saint. And, 
And I say that because, you know, we'll talk about this, but she, I don't know her, but it sounds like she was just through reading a lot of stuff and listening to a lot of stuff. She was just so pushing you forward and just supportive on whatever you both wanted to do, which is getting to Israel and with no questions asked. Right. So, yeah, that's true. I mean, um, I suppose you could look at my, my desire to con- constantly try to actualize myself as, as a glutton for punishment, but I can't sit still. I, that, that I find is punishing. And I always am trying to look for goals and, um, and I'm always trying to figure out some new goal and try and pour myself into it. Um, you know, becoming religious was one of those goals, uh, uh, moving to Israel, becoming an engineer, working for startups, um, becoming a rabbi. I mean, I did my, I did my rabbinical learning basically on the side while I was, while I was designing the chip for Mobileye for 16 years. So six of those years, I went two nights a week, um, you know, for every single week. I, if I missed, I, I listened to the recordings. I never missed a class basically. Um, and, you know, coming from where I was coming from, I remember when my wife also, as, as you've mentioned, that well, obviously my wife must be a saint and you're correct because there's no way I could do this without <laughs> her. Um, right. And she's always seen the goals that I was interested in and, and pushed me to do them. Getting smicha was one of them. And she, I remember she was always cutting out ads. Look, there's this program, there's that program, you know. And I kept saying, you know, no, these are not good. Um, finally, she found this program at Merkaz Harav, um, where it said, you know, strong yeshiva background required. And I don't have a strong yeshiva background, but I have a lot of motivation. And so basically, I came home from class every night and I sat up for hours with, a, with an Aramaic Hebrew dictionary, translating into Hebrew and then translating into English. And then I basically, in order to, to be able to study the whole um, Isur Vaheter, I, I translated all the, the Shulchan Aruch, the tour, all the commentaries, basically wrote them in English so that I could review them again. So, you know, it's a lot of effort, but it's also a lot of reward. Um, and, I want and you then, to start, give a quick timeline, just so people understand. I'm, I've, you know, done a lot of research, but just so if you could do a quick timeline of okay, college, and just the different positions that you had quickly through college, and then we'll go back through, but... Okay, so um, while I was working, while I was studying computer engineering at UCLA, um, in my second year, I got a student internship at the NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I did that all through college. Um, After college, um, I worked for a couple of small companies, and then, this, and then I got married shortly thereafter. We came to Israel and did like a year of, of traveling yeshiva. Trying to, and that was the first time I ever came to Israel. Um, and so on the one hand, it was like, you know, really interesting and new. And you see this new country. But my wife and I were all the time trying to assess, like, how are we going to live here? So there was a lot of stress in, in going through and, and traveling around. It wasn't like we were just sightseeing. Um, we were like house scene, home scene. Anyway, um, then we then we went back to LA. I worked for a company um, called Aura that had a lot of defense contracts. That's when I built this uh, um, missile system. Basically, it was part of uh, Ronald Reagan's Star Wars that um, shooting missiles out of missiles against missiles in space. Um, I did that for a couple of years, and then. Um, that's when we decided to move back to Israel. We, we already had kids and we realized that we really need to move our family before the kids are in the school system. That makes it very difficult. So we had a one-year-old and a three-year-old. We came to Haifa and I worked for IBM. Um, IBM was a great place to work for in terms of technology, but a terrible place to live in terms of like, you know, American religious person in Haifa in 1992 was very, very difficult. So I left there after a year, came to Jerusalem, worked for a startup that went under like in a couple of months, but got me to Jerusalem. Um, worked for another startup in, in uh, Herzliya Pituach, where I did uh, video on demand systems, the first video on demand for airplanes. 
Um, and then also it was a great job, but the drive, driving Jerusalem Herzliya is, is, is also very, very difficult. So that's when I moved to, to, to a place in, in uh, Harfot Svim in Jerusalem called uh, NDS, News Data Systems, which was later bought out by Cisco. And uh, there I did encryption, decryption systems, basically systems that, that do pay, per, pay TV, pay per view, pay for whatever it is, right? You, you know, that it, you, you, if you paid, you, you get your channels decrypted. Um, and then uh, that takes us to the year 2000 when I tried to find a startup in the internet boom and I was making a fiber to the home networking system um, and that, just, that also went under because basically all of the internet went under at that time, basically the year 2000, 2001. And um, I still didn't give up on my, on my startup uh, goal of trying to work for someone. You can't be beaten I, down. You can't be beaten down. Right, <laughs> right. And, uh, and so that's when, I, and that's when I stumbled upon, upon this little um, startup that was doing something in the automotive industry. I said, okay, internet people are not buying, but cars people still will need to buy. And uh, so I went and worked for them, and um, 16 years later, they were bought by Intel for $15.3 billion. So. so there was a point in that journey, and we'll go back, but where someone told you, hold your breath, and they were telling to hold your breath for how long at that point? Uh, and, and talk about what, what they were referencing. Uh, okay, so um, when I was hired by Mobileye, so, you know, it's a startup, and they gave me options, and they cut my salary, and he said, you know, hold your breath, don't worry, we're going to have an exit in two years, you know, I understand that I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm putting some pressure on your on your lifestyle, basically I had to pull my kids out of all of their extracurricular activities, hmm. um, stop inviting people over for Shabbat, stop going out completely, um, don't buy anything, right? Um, and so, okay, fine, so you know, with two years, okay, we'll, we'll hang in there. And then, and then two years became three years, and three years became four years, and then it became a big joke in my house, like, so when is this exit <laughs> gonna happen? And you know, every year, the CEO would always get up in the company dinner and say, exit in two years. And he did that for 16 years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny, but it's really not funny in a sense. You know, that's a it. Looking back, it's funny, but it, when you have to go back to your your wife and kids and tell them we have to pull you out of the extracurricular activities, what's that like? Right, it's not easy. It's not easy, and that's enough. That's another thing that you have to give my wife credit for. It's not only that you know she got behind me and all these these crazy goals that I try to fulfill, but but also you know it's biting the bullet literally you know and just saying okay we're gonna try this startup thing and see how it goes you know and everybody knows that the that the startup that, that the the percentages of startups that actually make it you know is very small and the numbers that make it like mobile are you know one in a million yeah i mean i just wanted you to to lay that out because it's a tattered journey you know, yeah. this is not, it's an overnight yeah. success after 35 yeah. years or whatever right. number of years, right. Right? right? And you had to sacrifice a lot to get That's to where true. you were. Also, look, when I, when I moved to Israel, we, we, we basically cut our salary in half. And, you know, the, living, the, the, the cost of living doesn't make that up. You're basically, you know, biting the bullet again. And then, and then... Uh, just, and that was, that was done with just because we said we want to live in Israel. And uh, yeah, that's right. It's not, it's not so simple. I remember somebody after the mobile I exit, somebody came up to me and said, wow, overnight success. And I said, <laughs> overnight in 16 years. But yeah. Right. You and know, all of a sudden people hear about it. It's the first time they heard about it. Exactly. Um, and so and we'll get to this. You had a realization when you were seven you know, about life and death and, and some profound questions you're talking about, which kind of relates to, you know, Israel known as a startup nation. But there were a couple of defining moments when I was listening to your journey a little bit, which is one, when your wife just said, let's move to Israel. And you're like, well, okay, I don't have a job and it seemed like she didn't care. Um, right. And the other one, which I love this story is 
is the, the interview you had at the airport. So if mm-hmm. you could just talk a little bit about that, because that to me was the, it started the trajectory essentially. Right. So, I mean, um, okay. I'll tell the, the, basically the interview was that I, I met the, the head of the chip design group of IBM whose name is Aaron Aaron. He's actually the head of the, the Israel Innovation Association today. Um, at the time, he was also um, a professor of, of computer technology or computer science in, at uh, the Technion. And he had taken a, a one-year sabbatical. He was coming to uh, San Francisco to work in Silicon Valley for a year. And so they said, you'll go meet him in the San Francisco airport and you'll have a technical interview and we'll see if we want you to work at IBM. And uh, so it sounded really great. You know, I'm going to the VIP lounge of the San Francisco airport, meet the head of the chip design group, right? I really made it. And all of a sudden, you know, they're playing Monday night football. People are getting drunk. There's music in the background. This guy's asking me finals questions from his computer science class at the Technion. And uh, so, you know, it, I'm like, I wasn't like, I was having a hard time. It's just, you know, he's giving me little hints and I'm giving him little answers. And, you know, basically I would say that I failed. And he said, thank you very much. And I folded up my stuff and I left. And then when I got to the door of the San Francisco VIP lounge, so I said to myself, I mean, this just can't be happening. I can't have just blown my chance to get to Israel. So I went back and he was sitting on the couch still. And I said, listen, you know, you know what I don't know, but you don't know what I do know. And I explained to him a lot of, I mean, I had my whole briefcase full of all kinds of, you know, schematics and drawings, diagrams and my design work for the past um, at least uh, five, 10 years. And so uh, I explained to him everything and he said, okay, thank you very much. And I left. Um, and then, you know, I got a call a week later from the head of IBM that they want to give me a job. Um, I think that, you know, that's the kind of sort of tenacity that you have to have. And, and you know, we believe in um, Hishtad Lut, right? I mean, I definitely think that it was the hand of God. But I think that the hand of God, you know, had, you have to, like, follow it. And you have to do something about it. And God doesn't help those who don't help themselves. And, and uh I don't know. I, I also, I think maybe, I don't know. I attribute a lot of it maybe to, to sports. You know, I did a lot of competitive sports and, and when I was a kid and in high school. I mean, I'm not like, you know, Mr. Super Athlete, but I do, I did do a lot of sports. And I think that that sort of influences you on like, you know, you, you know, don't let go and keep fighting till you win. Yeah. I mean, you got to the door and you thought, no, this is, that's not the outcome I want. I'm, I'm going back. And you said, I, t- I t- showed them everything that I worked on, but just talk a little about everything. I mean, everything is an understatement. Like you mentioned a couple things you're designing. Like what were some of the things that you well, walked I mean, the, him through? The, 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 yeah. I mean, so the, like the main project that I had worked on at that time was the, was this IRSP, the infrared scene projector, which is basically the, the missile testing system when you when you want to shoot a missile at another missile so you need to be able to test that before you go around shooting missiles into space and, and miss i would hope so <laughs> right so so basically what you need to do is uh, develop a simulator a simulator is 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 basically a movie screen of a missile going by and then you put the camera that's going to be on the american missile and you see how it follows this Russian missile going by on the, on, the, on the screen. So that sounds simple enough. We all know how to play a movie on a screen. But, um, it, but missiles aren't in, working in the visual spectrum. They're heat-seeking missiles. So you need to basically make a movie player that's playing in heat. So you have to paint a picture with laser beams. And, um, okay, so then the system starts getting to be a little more complicated. But... And there was other things, though, at that point uh, in your career that you had had done, right? I don't know. Which what are you th- what are you referring to? I mean, I I worked on a laser printer. I worked on laser diodes um, uh, at JPL. We worked on um, on a on the first automated Pap smear tester, where you basically instead of doctors having to look at cells under microscopes, it's all done automated which takes a lot of image processing and, and, um, and then 
basically does a yes, no, maybe, and the doctors look at the maybes. And, you know, there was another portion where you, I think, I don't know if you realize this was going to be a bigger vision of your company when the CEO came in and I don't know if it was a CEO or founder um, and gave a speech, but it wasn't the same old speech. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you're basically referring to the story of um, when Mobileye sort of did its, it's a pivot, what we would say that basically Mobileye, Mobileye was set up as a company um, doing image processing. We were trying to make a, an application called ACC adaptive cruise control. You know, it basically sees the car in front of you and it, just your speed to the car in front of you. And, uh, and then we, it was taking too long for that system to get into cars, to get integrated. And so we came up with uh, another product that we would ab be able to sell to the market you know, immediately. And that was this um, sort of warning system, which is pretty well known in Israel and slowly getting known in the rest of the world where you have a camera looking out your front windshield and it detects cars and people and lanes and it beeps you if you're gonna crash or it beeps you if you leave your lane without um, signaling. And um, we basically did this aftermarket product I mean, you can put it in your car after the market, after it's been sold. And really it was a, an afterthought. We're just trying to make some money. Um, but but uh, what turned out after analysis by all kinds of consumer products groups and insurance companies was that we were literally saving lives that we were changing the way people were driving we were helping people drive better and um so the ceo won this one company dinner so he he basically instead of getting up and usually giving the general ceo speech that that ceos get up a little pep talk for the workers um he got up and he was very serious and he said you know we're saving lives and and that really changed the whole direction of the company and that's when we became um, an ATIS company, Advanced Driving Assistance Systems, where, you know, instead of warning the driver you're going to crash, we put on the brakes. Instead of warning you that you're leaving your lane, we keep you in your lane. And so all of those kinds of applications have really become the bed, bread and butter of Mobileye and, and to this day. And then really there was the, based on all of those applications together that we got into the autonomous vehicle world as well. But, but really what's fueling um, auton I mean, automotive safety as well as, as the income of the company or, or the ATIS systems. So how do you think, you know, the chip will affect, and you give some really good talks out there on ethics, right? Yeah. How do you think it will affect other industries? Um, I mean, you're asking two questions here because there's, yeah. there's one, there's the technology how it will affect, and the other is the, is the is the morality and the ethics that go into all these kinds of things. So um, look, the, there's a lot, a lot of advanced um, image processing that's being done. And I'm sure that, that can, there's other applications and mobilize focused on the, on the automotive world, but there's definitely other robotic applications and where these kinds of things can be of use. So there, there's definitely going to be spillover from it, from the, in the technology world. Um, also, in the, the chip itself is a really a, a super duper um, image processor, which allows you to do all kinds of in, um, computation intensive um, algorithms. And so those things can apply in, in different places. We'll see how that plays out. Um, the other question is really what's very interesting is the is the ethics because. What's happened now, I mean, I wrote, a, I wrote a paper, which hopefully will be published soon in a, in a book on, on, on AI, um, which is, the, is, is, is ethical dilemmas like the trolley problem. So everybody's pretty much familiar with the trolley problem. There's a, there's a trolley running down a track. It doesn't have its brakes, and it has to choose between going straight and hitting five people or changing the lane and, hit, and killing one person. So these kinds of dilemmas have, have been around, well, at least since Philippa Foote wrote it in 1967, but these kinds of ethical dilemmas um, have been used in ethics courses and they push people into corners and get you to try to think in ways that you might not have thought before. I mean, it's not that, you know, lots of times when I give this talk, so they say, oh, well, why don't you just yell out at the people? Or why don't you just uh, turn the other way? Or, you know, like, and so you have to explain that the, the, the dilemma is not that you can get out of it. There could be a dilemma where you're, somebody's going to die. 
Now what are you going to do? Of course you're going to try to save everybody as much as you can and all that. But what if you can't? What if there is a case that somebody's going to die, five against one or, you know, whatever, all kinds of different possible dilemmas. And so um, these dilemmas are very interesting on an academic level. But now autonomous vehicles have made them very real. I'm not saying there's un there aren't other real applications. There are. But this has become, you know, a huge, huge topic. I mean, if you Google, you know, trolley problem, autonomous vehicle, you'll get like a million hits of like significant stuff. Um, and so it's been, it's, it's definitely been an interesting journey. I mean, like I said, I wrote a whole paper on it and there's a lot of people working on it. Um, I think that, that it's, it's important that it, what it, what it does, what it really does is tell you that, you know, technology is not enough for the world to be a better place. And that there's also this whole realm of ethics. And so that's something which is huge. And this is just one little example. And that in robotics in general, and AI in general, there's lots of ethical questions. I mean, the trolley problem is, is very pertinent for autonomous vehicles, but this is what I, you know, you mentioned that I'm working on my PhD. So um, the, the thesis of the PhD is the moral status of artificial intelligence. So this is another huge topic that people are talking about. And that is what happens when a robot gets to the level that you can't even tell if I, you're talking to me a person or me a robot. And so now, what's the moral status of this thing? Is it a machine, you know, or is it, is it have some kind of personhood? And, and, or, or is it really just like a person? And, you can, and I can show you today already ethicists that, are, that pick their place along the spectrum. There's a professor in America who says, you know, what do you think you are? You're just artificial intelligence out of meat. So there's no difference between you and a robot that's artificial intelligence out of silicon. And then there's other people that don't, don't go that far, but they still say a robot has personhood. And I read an article by a guy um, who said that, you know, a robot can get married and has a marriage certificate. And so these are huge questions that technology is bringing to bear and, and, and really cannot answer. Ethics has to answer this. It's and a so slippery where, slope, right? Excuse me? It's a slippery slope. Like there's yes, a lot of gray yes. along the path. Exactly. And so, I mean, there's a couple of points that I, would, that I hope to make in my thesis. And one of them is, is that, that, no, you're not artificial intelligence out of me. And that, and that, you know, we believe that there is something about a human being which is different than a smart machine, no matter how smart it is. And so that's one of the things that I would like to try to demonstrate philosophically. Um, and then the other is, you know, the, 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 the implications. Um, so that if there is a difference between people and machines, so then how do you deal with them? And, um, you know, there's, there's a case to be made. Somebody, uh, there, one of the articles that I was reading talked about that, okay, even if we agree that there's a difference between people and robots, you may still ethically need to, relate to robots as people because if you don't you may end up relating to people as machines <laughs> right and so there might so it, it starts to become very interesting and now this is really only one aspect that i'm trying to narrow my field there's a huge huge aspect about how do you ethically program these things you know isaac asimov many many years ago wrote these three rules of robotics that you know they shouldn't hurt anybody Right. And, and OK, but now everybody understands that's not enough to define the ethics of how these things act. Now, I'm not even touching that. That's also a huge, huge, huge field about, you know, how do we define what a robot does? And, and that's another thing which there's a lot of fear that these things are, you know, if it's artificial intelligence, they learn on their own. And then all of a sudden they learn to, like, take over the world and we're in the matrix. <laughs> that's why they're going to make a movie of you. No, I feel like it I was a movie unfolded in the journey. So, um, so what do you think that little thing is? You mentioned there's something that's different between humans and robots. It's right. some little okay, thing. So, yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, religious people like me will call it a soul. Okay. That there's some spirituality, but even not religious people, they call it consciousness. Okay, 
And there's a huge, huge question among secular ethicists, not religious people, not Jewish people, okay, that what exactly is consciousness? And there's a gap between we know exactly how your brain works and all the neurons and the, and, and the synapses exploding and we can map everything. And, you know, we know exactly, you know, what happened so that you can see um, that this car is red. Okay, but now I program the mobile eye chip and I can also tell that I'm looking at a red car. But my computer chip that sees the red car just says, okay, red car, right? Now, now what? But when you see a red your car, you're like, wow, I want that. I like that car. You have right? some emotions around it, yeah. Exactly. And so what is that? What is that little gap we still haven't been able to find? There's a, there's a famous um, philosopher whose name is David Chalmers, and he wrote an article several years ago called The Hard Problem of Consciousness. And that's the hard problem. We still can't define it. And we still can't figure out. We can't map it. And so, you know, there is room to say, at least today, that that's that distinction between man and machine. But that, you know, these are, okay, these are things that need to be worked out. <laughs> It, there's, yeah, I mean, there's no easy answer. Um, but what were some, what are some, some of the other stuff that you talk about it that you found in your research that you talk about in the, the moral status of artificial intelligence? Um, so, um, like I said, I'm really just at the very beginning mm. of my research, but there's a, there's a lot of questions of, of trying to parallel this to animals, you know, that animals are sentient and that, and that robots may become sentient. And then, you know, if something can feel or sense or, 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 or experience pain. So then they, they're a higher level than just a machine, you know, and then in Judaism, so there's a, there's, there's a level of objects, right? You're not allowed to destroy objects and you have to pay for it and et cetera and replace it and all that kind of stuff. And then there's level of animals that you're not supposed to harm animals for no good reason. And there's, you know, all the, the ethics and halacha of, of that. And then there's people, right? So then these, it, it's going to be interesting to see like where do, where do robots map into all of this? It's interesting just to hear your thoughts because yeah, you just started this PhD, but you've been thinking about this stuff and in this industry for 35 years. And so, you know, you mentioned the, the ch this stuff spilling over, this technology spilling over and other things. What do you think this, I mean, to you, this is, like normal everyday life. You've been living this. You could see these things clearly. For most people, even sometimes thinking of an autonomous vehicle is groundbreaking, right? right? So right. where do you think this will spill over? What it will, what, the technology, I'm not, I'm not, besides cars, you know, um, you, you mentioned it may spill over into other aspects of society. I mean, like, look, uh, the, well, what I was saying was, was that, okay, there's, there's a lot of technology that's driving this. I mean, there's the image processing aspects. There's the, there's the data collection that's going on. There's, um, there's the AI itself. There's the hardware supporting AI. You know, AI had a, a big kick, I think, in like the late 80s that you know, everybody got really excited about it, but then it died because there wasn't the underlying hardware to support the kinds of calculations that you needed to be able to do. The reason that AI is actually having a resurgence now, it's, this isn't new, this is a resurgence of an, of an old dream, is because the hardware has now been able to support it. So the kinds of chips and, and, and technology that we're working at Mobileye, and there are other people that are also working on it, are, are, are enabling AI to be applied to all kinds of other places and, and, and applications. I mean, robotics is for sure one of them. I mean, you know, an autonomous vehicle is just a very specific application of robotics. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can be done. Um, but what I found more interesting and in what, what we were just talking about, I think is important to emphasize is that, you know, I love technology and I love science, but I also love you know, Torah, morals, ethics. And I think that there's really a confluence and that people have to understand that you can't have one without the other. And that, you know, I think that's the story of the Tower of Babel, right? That it's that these people learn how to burn bricks. This was a huge technological advancement, okay? And then they built a tower, okay? The tower was basically saying, we don't need ethics. 
go away. Look, we can, we can get to the, we can get to the sky. We can define, we don't need any God. But so then they ended up killing each other. Okay. And they ended up just basically breaking the breakdown of society. And so I think that that's an amazing metaphor for the need of the confluence between technology, which there's no question is a great thing that has improved the lives of humanity and continues to do so. But it also needs to stay in check with, with, with ethics and with philosophy. And so it's not that there's these two different realms and there's these people that sit in this box and they don't No, the two are very much together. And that's, well, I mean, look, at the end of the day, that's what we call Torah Umada. Right? It's Torah and science. It's, and science is very general. It's, it's all these things that are promoting life that are outside of, of ethics and halacha, Jewish law, and, and so forth. It was interesting how you kind of concluded your ta- your, one of your ethics talks that I watched. And I felt like I need some closure or conclusion to it. I'm left hanging, but, but the reality is, I don't know if there really is an answer, but you kind of broke down all the factors that go into creating a technology and making decisions, right? There's government, but the funny thing is the way you broke it down is you're a coder, you have the coder who coded it, but that person just wants to, you know, code it in the least amount of code possible. Um, And like, I just want to get home to my kids. Do you really want the person who's going to just want to get home to their kids and finish the code quickly, determining if you should veer this way or this way. Right. So what you're, I mean, basically what you're referring to is at the, at the, at the end of the, my discussion about how do we make a decision of who's going to die in the trolley problem. Um, so I, I bring a lot of different opinions and different ways to try to solve that problem. And then I say, but so then who really gets to make that decision? And so what I was trying to say there is that you know, it's not, it's not necessarily like some people would think it's the people that are directly involved, the programmer or the, the technology provider or the automobile provider or, you know, like there's all these layers of people who are very directly involved in the development of the technology. And I want to say that, no, those people are technologists. Those people are business people. Those people have an agenda. And that, again, emphasizes why you do need ethicists and you do need people outside that are able to come and look at things objectively and provide ethical guidance. And so, um, yeah, there's definitely this, there's a, there's a need for this confluence between these two very different worlds. I feel like when you talk about, when people talk about autonomous vehicles, there's an argument that people bring up and well, if there's someone in the middle of the road and you're on a cliff, you know, have heard it and, well, to avoid the people, you veer off the cliff and don't kill the three people, and then you get killed as the driver. And right. you're you're talking about that and saying, well, is that first of all, is that really going to happen right. <laughs> in general? <laughs> but do you want a car that's basically going to kill you over killing three other people? You know, correct. So that's a that's another huge huge topic that people talk about. That say, okay, fine. You know, at the end of the day, let's say that ethically. Um, we come to the conclusion that um, the driver has to die. We did all the calculations and the fair, right, just thing is that the driver dies. But so now you may not be able to sell a car like that. And, uh, you know, like it's not they, a good they, tagline. They, they, did, they, did, they did surveys. They said, you know, would you like, a, would you like to have an autonomous vehicle that, that reduced car accidents by 99%, you know, it's going to save the world. And everybody says, of course, great. And they said, would you buy that car if you were the person that would have to die? And everybody says, no. <laughs> right? I don't want. So then the question becomes, okay, so then now um, if no one will buy this car, so now we're still killing thousands of people a day on the roads. And so maybe we have to forego that and, 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 so these are, again, I, I still see these as kind of technical questions that are theoretical almost, because like I said, the odds that such a situation is going to come to be that there's 3,400 people dying on the roads every day today with people driving. And so the sooner that we can get people off the, the or, or let's say away from the steering wheel, right, we're going to start saving lives. 
And so again, these kinds of questions are really interesting theoretically, and they do need to be applied. Um, but then, you know, the number of cases that such a, I mean, in the case of the trolley problem, it's pretty minimal. So Moise, you know, I want to go back to when you were age seven or eight, and you were thinking of this deep question of <clears throat> real, you realize at the time people died. And I'd love to explore this, I, your take on this, because you're a scientist and rabbi in one. What do you, what do you think happens after someone dies? Uh, what do I think happens after yeah. somebody dies? That's a good question. I mean, I, obviously I wasn't there, and, and so I don't know. Um, I believe that, you know, there's, there's a sort of, okay, there's, there's, the, there's what Judaism talks about, and there's also what, um, I don't know, there's, 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 there's a book called Life After Life by Raymond Moody. Um, there's lots of people where there's, where there's sign of this collective consciousness that talks about a tunnel and the light and, and relatives and seeing your life and so forth. Um, so yeah, I kind of believe that that's the, that in general, I think that, yeah, that you're going to get to the other side and you're going to realize that, that, that this is a very limited reality that we've been in and that there's this huge, huge reality out there and that you're going to have, you know, a review of your life. And, um, I think Arya Kaplan talks about this very rationally and he says that, that, um, you know, we don't believe in, in heaven and hell, you know, the hell is sort of the embarrassment of having wasted opportunities, right? And so when you're doing your life review, it's your life and there's nothing, you know, you're going to see, you're, you know, you know, no one needs to tell you, oh, that was good or that was a mistake or that was really not what you should have done. And, you know, so, but now you're going to be judging yourself. And um, so obviously it's going to be difficult on those times when we've blown it. And, uh, and I think also Judaism provides this kind of idea of tshuva on a daily basis, on an annual basis, you know, whenever you can to like sort of like say, okay, I realize that that wasn't right and I need to like work on that. And so then if you were going to have an, a life overview, so you would have said, yeah, I, I realized that already. So it's not a surprise and I'm not, I don't have any issues. I dealt with it. And it's the stuff that you didn't deal with. And so, um, I, yeah, I, that's, that's sort of, I, that I sort of believe in this kind of conventional uh, approach where, like I said, I think it's pretty well rooted in Jewish sources and it's in, in popular cultures around the world kind of ascribed to it. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, there's obviously, I, I just wanted to hear your take on it. Um, I was really curious and, you know, as far as the, you know, the, why did you, after you, after um, Mobileye sold, what made you decide to go on and get your PhD in this topic? Because um, you could, you could do whatever you want. You, know, um, you could correct. join another startup right. <laughs> if you, if you wanted to correct. torture yourself. But yeah. um, I mean, why? I'm actually advising a startup just for yeah. fun on the side. Okay. But, um, uh, because people approached me, you know, but that wasn't like what I'm looking to do. I'm, I mean, it's interesting and so fine. Um, but really, my, I'm, I'm trying to follow m my dream of, of, of Judaism and philosophy. And so I'm doing Jewish philosophy. And like you mentioned, I mean, when, when I was a little kid and I found out that people die, um, so that really jolted me. And it, and it jolted me in a way that not that like I was afraid or I don't know what, I just was like, okay, so, so what's the point? What's the point, right? And, and that's sort of driven me throughout my life, um, is, that, is that I, you know, I think about things in a philosophical way, and I'm trying to like understand, you know, what are we doing here? And, um, and, and look, you know, I mean, I'm not unique in that sense. Uh, Viktor Frankl um, was a famous logotherapist, uh, said that, you know, man is driven by purpose. You know, we all, at the end of the day, try to find some meaning in our lives. And um, it depends, you know, you can find meaning in small things, you can find meaning in big things. I, I, I try to find the meaning of life. Yeah, yeah, Man's Search for Meaning is definitely one of my favorite, favorite books of all time. Right, right, it's a very important book. 
You, you mentioned, I mentioned in the beginning, you know, the mobile story is a story of the startup nation, which is your story, the story of the Jewish people. Um, why? And you've got a, had a lot of people from all over the world come and try and figure out why is Israel known as the startup nation? Correct. So what do you tell, what do you tell What do people? I tell people? Yeah. Um, well, look, you know, I try to tell them this story um, which is like you've mentioned, it's basically like my story and the mobilized story and the story of the Jewish people. It's really a story of, of ups and downs. It's a really a story of like, you know, biting the bullet and, and, and continuing to move forward in spite of everything, right? It's being able to, you know, whether it's on a personal level and say, you know, I'm going to cut my salary in half because it's, I find it meaningful to move back to the land of Israel. Um, it's, 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 working for a company where, you know, it, everything is cut to the bare bones and we're, we're, but we're going to fulfill this, you know, uh, on, on the company level. I mean, we were definitely very proud to be the only company on the face of the earth that was working on this one problem, trying to solve um, this image processing using um, basically doing 3D object detection with a single camera. Um, and, and it's also on the, on the Jewish nation level where, We've definitely had to take hits and, and, you know, hunker down and try to figure out and, and, and not convert and not give up and, and continue to persevere in our beliefs. And so um, that's really, I think, what the Startup Nation is about. It's about purpose. I mean, uh, uh, there's a famous quote that I bring in the middle of the book that basically with all of its difficulties, Israel has one commanding advantage, a sense of purpose. And so... You know, well, somebody once told me, oh, so do you think that so if any if some startup has purpose or they're going to be they're going to make it? I'm like, that's not what I meant. What I meant is that purpose gives you a drive and it gives you a will to persevere. There's many other factors that make a, a company successful or not successful. But as an individual, as a corporation or as a as a country, you know, if you have goals and you have and you and you have and you believe in them so that gives you purpose and that gives you drive and and i think that's really what's fundamental about the jewish people um yeah there's a great quote from paul johnson's book of the history of the jews where he talks about that no people has argued as vehemently as the jews that creation has a purpose hmm you know, talking about startups, you know, like the, the person in your, your company said, hold your breath, right? And so there's a lot, like you said, most, most startups don't succeed. Are there things that you look at because you've been through failed startups, you've been through obviously a successful one, that someone should just quit? Like throw in the towel, like the, they should not keep fighting and struggling. Are there certain factors that you, you, you see you know, looking back that if someone is in a startup now, they've been toiling out, they could toil out for 10, 6, 15, 16, 20 years and it not have a successful outcome. Um, what do you look for in, if you were to invest in a company, let's say that is asking you to invest a lot of money, Hey, this is what we have. What are you looking at to see, is this going to be successful? So, I mean, you're asking kind of like two different questions. I mean, there's the, there's the one question, like when should people throw in the towel versus, you know, what do you look at to see if, you know, it's a worthwhile investment that, you know, the company has good odds of continuing. Throwing in the towel is something very difficult. And, and on the startups that I've worked for, the towel was thrown in for you. Right? <laughs> um, most people don't throw in the towel, like, you know, like, uh, basically, um, you're out of money, you know, um, and there's, and that could be for all kinds of reasons. But uh, a couple of the startups went under because of money. One was because they were spending way too much. You know, everybody was getting new cars and going out to lunch and just thinking, you know, oh, we, you know, they were burning money. And so they went, ran out. Okay, so that was, that was mismanagement. Um, the other company I went, I worked for that was the, they, they ran out of money was basically because they had planned on going to the stock market at the time when the stock market crashed. And so I, I, you can't really blame the management, although 
you know, they may, it would have been better to have more of an initial investment before hiring so many people to do so much work. But, um, so that's one thing. And the other about trying to look for, you know, a worthwhile startups. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different factors. Uh, you, you know, Mobileye in hindsight, obviously was a, was a great idea because they were bringing new technology, something that nobody ever did or everybody, nobody ever even thought could be done to detect 3D objects with a single camera. Now that doesn't mean that every good startup is gonna have some kind of like scientific breakthrough, but you definitely need some kind of unique technology, you know? And then you need, a, and then you need a, a business model, something that you're like, Mobileye, was looking at a huge market, the entire, auton uh, entire automotive industry, right? To have a chip in every car, um, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of chips. <laughs> and so you want to try to yeah. be, you know, in a, in, a, in a big market, somewhere where there's a lot of me. Um, I remember my brother made fun of me once. I wrote some little program to do like holiday calculations, you know, and, and he said, oh, there is going to be a lot of people lining up to buy this one. <laughs> <laughs> so you know not a big market yeah <laughs> exactly so you know you want to try to 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 focus on a big market um and have some kind of a technological advantage in terms of that you're bringing something new to the market um and yeah. then of course there's the people and the funding um you know the people that that they have to have some kind of experience within that within that market and within that field yeah. Moise, first of all, I have, I have one or two last questions, but first of all, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for sharing your story. It, it's truly an inspiration to hear your journey. And so I really appreciate you sharing it and everyone who listens to it, I, I think will be inspired also. Um, before I ask the questions, where should we point people towards to learn more about you, what you're working on? Mm -hmm. On the I mean, web, where should we? Website, I have a website. It's called Divrei Navon, D I V R E I N A V O N. So at divreinavon.com, basically, I have I have like all the papers I've published. I have um, all kinds of shiurim where I teach people um, all kinds of basically, you know, Torah umada kind of stuff. You know, trying to integrate um, what's going on in the world with what we've been learning as a people for 2000 years. Yeah. So everyone check it out. Um, there's some fascinating things on there for sure. I've, I've been on there. Um, so the two last questions I always ask, Mois, because it's Inspired Insider, I always ask, what's been a low point, a really low point that you had to push through in the journey? And I'm sure there's, there's a lot of low points. Um, one that sticks out. And then what's been a proud moment for you on the journey? So what's, what's yeah. been sticks out to you as a, the especially low, a low point. The, clearly the lowest point was when, um, uh, the, one of the startups had fallen through. I didn't have really any idea how it was going to continue We're here in Israel. And I, and, you know, I took my wife out and I, you know, we went just to have like a, a coffee in a, in a, in a, uh, hotel lobby in Jerusalem and I said you know we're at the bottom you know and I don't know what we're gonna do and we may have to go back or I don't know what we're gonna do and you know she said well we'll make it hmm. we'll do what we have to do hmm. um, and uh, yeah there's times when you know you really like I mean uh, on, on that same time, I mean, there was another, there was actually another time I went to her and I said, that's it. You know, I just, I think we're just going to go back. And she just started crying and she wouldn't, she wouldn't say, you know, she would just wouldn't accept it. And we stayed. And, uh, you know, what do you think gives your wife that perseverance? Like she just has <laughs> that, that same thing time and time again of you getting to the door, be like, no. I'm not leaving without this job. It right. seems like the whole way through, she's the same way, which is, no, nope, we're going to make it. Nope, we're not leaving. Sorry. Right. What do right. you think gives her that perseverance? <clears throat> I don't know. I guess, you know, I, I guess you have to call it faith. You know, at some point, you believe 
in what you're doing is the right thing. I think my wife has always believed that, that this is the home of the Jews and this is where, you know, we're going to make it. And, uh, and she's had the faith to just say, I don't care, you know, and I don't care if we're poor and, you know, so we'll, we'll just eat more tuna and pasta or whatever it is. And that's that, you know? Yeah. And um, obviously the high, the high point was uh, standing on the New York Stock Exchange holding my wife's hand when they rang the bell that our stock went public after 16 years of biting the bullet. Yeah. What was going through your head when that happened? Wow. <laughs> Just wow. I mean, you know, I can't believe it. And, and uh, Akola Tova. Yeah. I see. It's like, I don't know if like your time, that timeline flashed before your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <At that point. laughs> um, thank you, Rabbi. I really appreciate it. This was absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, I hope other people are inspired like, like I have been in, and this technology is going to save a lot of lives and make a huge difference in in the universe. So like that thought you had at age seven, you know, whatever triggered that, thank God, (laughs) right? Literally, figuratively, um, for what you've helped create. So, so thank you. Thank you you. very much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.